Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we have returning special guest Ton with his Lexus GX470. And what we're going to do for Ton today is we are going to do a front brake upgrade. The upgrade is you take calipers and rotors from a GX460 or a 5th gen 4Runner and you put them on the GX470. When they made the GX460 and the 5th Gen 4Runner, they put bigger rotors on those vehicles. And with a bigger rotor, you're gonna get better heat dissipation. So if you're driving down a long grade and you happen to be using a lot of brake and maybe not as much engine braking that you should be using to not overheat your brakes, those larger rotors are gonna dissipate the heat better than a smaller rotor and you'll get less brake fade because of it. This upgrade is supposed to be completely plug and play. There's no alteration or trimming of dust shields or anything like that. You should be able to disconnect the brake hard line, unbolt the caliper, pull the rotor off, put the new stuff back on, and it's as easy as that. Everything bolts up and works perfectly. One additional thing that we're gonna do is Ton decided to buy new front brake lines, the flexible lines. So currently they're rubber lines and Ton is gonna upgrade those to steel braided lines. And the benefit of steel braided lines is there'll be a little bit less expansion of the inside diameter of the hose when you apply the brakes. There's a little bit of expansion that happens and with a steel braided line, that's going to keep that expansion to a lesser amount, thus allowing more fluid pressure to get to that caliper so it's stronger braking. So it is a nice thing to do while doing an upgrade like this to upgrade those rubber lines to steel braided lines. With all that said, let's show you all the parts Ton bought for this job. We'll start off showing you the calipers that he bought. These again are for a GX460 or a 5th Gen 4Runner. They normally come in a gray color, but Ton and his fiance painted them orange. He got OEM Toyota pads. It's good to get the anti-squeal shims when you're doing the brakes. You'll also want to get these anti-rattle springs. There's two of them, one per side. You could buy an extra set so you have an anti-rattle spring on the upper and lower part of the pad. That's personal preference. Here's the rotors. And here's the part number. And then the aftermarket braided lines he got from Stop Tech. And this is everything Ton got for the job. You'll also want to have some DOT 3 brake fluid on hand because you're going to have to bleed your front brakes after you get these parts swapped on. To prep for this job, we jacked up the front end of the vehicle. We supported it on six ton jack stands on both sides. And we have the parking brake set and the backs of the rear wheels chalked because we are at a slant in my driveway. A good place to jack up the front end of this vehicle to where you can jack it up evenly all at one shot is the center cross member under the engine. I'll show you. It's this cross member right here. It's basically right underneath the back of the engine and at the start of the transmission bell housing. If you jack right up into the center, you can lift the vehicle equally and then get jack stands on either sides of the frame rails. Because Ton has rock rails, we actually have the vehicle supported on the rock rails, but you would just want to support it on the frame if you didn't have rock rails like Ton does. We already got the wheels off. The way we got the wheels off is by using a DeWalt impact gun this sucker right here if you didn't have an impact gun then you'd want to loosen the lug nuts with the wheels on the ground because the wheels on the ground would provide the friction needed for you to break free the lug nuts and then you can jack it up in the air and finish taking off all the lug nuts and get your wheels set off to the side we did the driver's side first and we learned a couple things and now we're going to show you how to do the passenger side they're both exactly the same we're first going to break free this metal hard line from the rubber line. I'm going to just loosen it a little bit to let me know that I can spin it off easily. And then I'm going to remove this clip. And this clip holds the rubber line to this bracket that attaches to the frame. And once that clip is out of the way, I'm going to finish taking out the metal hard line from the rubber line. And then I'm going to cap that 
with a 730 seconds vacuum cap over the flared end of the tubing to stop the flow of brake fluid. To brake free any type of line fitting, whether it's gonna be a brake line or a fuel line, you're gonna to wanna to use a flare nut wrench because it gets a better connection to the fitting on four sides of it. If you use an open end wrench, now you're only getting two sides of connection with the wrench and you have a much better chance of rounding off the fitting and then you're gonna be bumming. So if you don't have flare nut wrenches, I highly recommend you get a set. These are nice, they come from gear wrench and they're flex head. So they allow you to get into different positions, especially when you can't get a straight shot at the fitting. This is a 10 millimeter. Okay, it's broken free. I'm just gonna make sure it's loose enough and it's gonna not fight me once I get this clip out because once this clip is off, then nothing's really holding it firm and I might have a hard time backing it out. So that feels pretty good. All right, I know it's gonna come out with no problem. So I'm just gonna tighten this back up just a little bit to stop the flow of brake fluid. You'll see a little bit dripping down right now. It's okay to use an open end wrench once you break it free with a flare nut wrench because now all the force needed to break it free has already been done by the flare nut and this will just make it easier for you to reset the wrench multiple times as opposed to using a flare nut wrench. So now I'm going to get a little pry bar in here and I'm going to pry back towards me with this brake line clip. I'm just using a small pry bar and I'm just wedging it in between the metal part of the rubber line and the clip and I'm just going to pry out a little bit. And once it's out a lot, you could just pull it out with your hands, most likely, or grab onto it with a pair of pliers. Now you can see this is loose. With the clip out of the way, now I'm gonna use my open end 10 millimeter, and I'm gonna back out this hard line all the way out. Feels like I might be able to just do it with my hand, and I can. Okay, it's almost ready to come out. I'm gonna get my vacuum cap. This is what it looks like. It comes out of a kit that I have and I'm gonna just slip it over the flare tubing. As you can see, it doesn't go over the fitting threads, it just fits over the end of the tubing and it stops the flow of fluid. So I highly recommend you do this so you don't just continually drain out brake fluid and then your bleeding process is gonna be that much harder. And if it's really extreme, you're gonna drain your master cylinder and then you're gonna to have to bleed your master cylinder, which is a whole nother thing that you don't really wanna do if you don't have to. So I highly recommend you cap off the line with the vacuum cap, 730 seconds. I'm next gonna break free the metal hard line that leads from the caliper to the rubber hose at this bracket connection that attaches to the steering knuckle. I'm again gonna use the 10 millimeter flare nut wrench to break it free first. Okay, that's loose. Just gonna give it a couple more turns with an open end to make sure that it's coming out nice and easy. Okay, it is. I'm gonna grab a pry bar and I'm gonna knock this clip it goes in from the backside towards the front and I'm just gonna get onto it with a pry bar and knock it out with a hammer. Okay, it's almost out. I think I can work it out with my hand. There it is. And I'm gonna now loosen it the rest of the way with the open end. Okay, it's coming out easy with my hand. Right now we have a catch basin underneath here to catch the brake fluid that's coming out. So we've got our rubber soft line disconnected. The next thing we want to do is we want to disconnect the metal hard line from the brake caliper itself. Okay, it's broken free with the flare nut wrench. I'm going to transition to the open end. Might be able to get it off the rest of the way with my hand and I can. This brake line's a little bit bent on this side. One thing that we did on the other side that we're gonna do on this side, I'm gonna mark the side that attaches to the caliper with a orange paint pen to let me know that's the side that attaches to the caliper so I don't transpose it and then wonder why the brake line isn't fitting right. So you see I got a orange paint pen mark on the side that attaches to the caliper. For the ease of working on the brake caliper on the passenger side, we turn the wheels to the left, 
which opens it up more to where you have more room to work. If we had them straight, we'd be working over here. The bolts that hold the caliper to the steering knuckle are 17 millimeter. I'm gonna see if my little 3 8 to wall gun can do it. And it's not up to the task. I'm gonna go to my bigger gun with the 17 millimeter. There's one. I'm gonna support the caliper now because I'm taking out the second one. And then this should just slide right off. A little brake fluid might come out at you and you've got the caliper off, as easy as that. You're most likely gonna find that the rotor is just not gonna come off for you because it's been up against that hub face for a long time and a little bit of corrosion develops and then it doesn't wanna break free from the hub face. So you have to persuade it a little bit. You can use a dead blow hammer or a plastic hammer and you just start wailing on it and it'll come loose for you. Watch. Oh, just one shot. I guess I'm stronger than I thought I was. <laughs> and there we go, there's the rotor off. If you find you have a bunch of dirt and debris on your brake dust shield and around the hub, go ahead and use a brake cleaner and just spray it on here and wipe it with a clean rag to get any of the extra gunk out of here. You want to have a catch basin underneath to catch all the gunk. I'm going to clean off the hub face, get some of the corrosion off, and when I put the new rotor on, I'm going to put a little bit of anti-seize on this surface to help facilitate the removal of the rotor in the future. If you've got some stubborn gunk on here, you can grab a steel brush or a brass brush with your brake cleaner and just rub it and get a little more of the gunk off. I think a steel one would be better than the brass one. This brass one's a little too soft. I'm just using some copper anti-seize onto the surface right here. You don't have to put it too heavy and just get it on all the flat surfaces here so the rotor is gonna be less inclined to get locked on there in the future. That's good enough. We're gonna do a comparison for you of the old rotor to the new rotor. And if I line these up, you can see that the new rotor is thicker. It looks like it's about probably a quarter of an inch, somewhere around there. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, about. Maybe not as much as a quarter, a maybe a little less than a quarter of an inch. So with that larger size rotor, it's gonna dissipate heat much better than the smaller one. When these rotors come from the factory, or if you're using aftermarket, when they come from an aftermarket supplier, they put a film on it to reduce the chance of rusting. And you want to wash off that film by applying some brake cleaner to it. So you could just get it over a catch basin. And you just want to spray it on here. And then you want to use a clean rag and wipe it off. You might want to do this a couple times with the brake cleaner and a clean rag just to make sure you get all of that protective film off of there. All right, we've got the rotor surface clean and we're gonna slide it onto the hub. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a couple of the lug nuts on opposing sides and tighten the rotor up against the face of the hub. And the reason why we wanna do that is we want the rotor completely against the face of the hub to where we'll have an easier time getting the caliper slid over the rotor in, in the proper position. You might wanna pop it with your hands to make sure it's fully seated. You'll quite often find that you think you have it fully seated, but you don't. And you'll really know it when you try to get the caliper slid over the rotor. It's not gonna line up correctly. So pop it a few times, tighten up the lug nuts. Okay, I think that's all the way seated. I cleaned up the two caliper bolts with a little bit of brake cleaner. And I'm gonna go ahead and just put a little bit of multi-purpose grease right near the end where there's a little bit of rust. Just to help protect the metal of the bolt and to make removal next time a little bit easier. So just a little bit of multi-purpose grease. You could use a little anti-seize too if you want. Okay, both bolts are ready. And now I gotta get the new caliper slid over. I'm supporting the caliper with one hand 
and I slide it over the rotor and I get one of the bolts ready and I get it started. Okay, I've got the upper one started and I'm gonna get the bottom one started. All right, they're both started. I'm gonna transition to my Milwaukee ratchet and just zip them in lightly the rest of the way. Okay, those are both cinched up. All right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna slide the pads with the anti-squeal shims in place on either side of the rotor. All right, you got your pad. One of the pads is gonna have a wear indicator. It's this little metal tab right here. And what that does is once the brake pad material gets pretty close to the metal piece of the brake pad, it's gonna start squealing and you're gonna be wondering, what is that noise coming from my brakes? And basically that's this little metal tab here squealing against the rotor, letting you know, hey, it's time for a brake job. Which side you put that on, whether it's on the inside or the outside, I don't think it makes a difference. It's just there to alert you that you have worn out brake pads and you need to get in there and replace them. So you take your anti-squeal pad, the black side faces the pad and you'll see that it's got a little cutout here so you match that cutout so you put it on with the black side facing these little tabs hook over like that and hold it in place and obviously the concave cutout side goes in first and the convex or curved side faces outboard these calipers came with the pins already inserted and it has a retaining clip right here. What you gotta do is you have to push this out of the hole here, and then you could slide it out of each pin hole. There's a hole at the end of each pin, and this little clip slides into each side, and then you can remove it. And then you could simply slide these rods out. <laughs> like that, and eject them. With the pins out of the way, we could slide our pads in place and then I'll slide the other one in. Now that I have both brake pads on either side of the rotor, I'm gonna put the anti-rattle spring in and you'll see how it's shaped. It's got these U-shaped sections and those sections right there are gonna rest on the edge of the brake pad and these little metal ends are gonna go into these holes right here. So I'm gonna get one side started, I'm gonna Put the U-shaped thing on the edge of the pad, and then I'm gonna get the other side in place. Okay, so the anti-rattle spring is in position. I'm gonna to wanna to lubricate two parts of this brake caliper rod, right here and right here, because when you apply the brakes, you want the brake pads to slide freely on the rod to where they clamp onto the rotor when you're braking and then retract when you let off the brakes. And I'm gonna use the CRC synthetic brake caliper grease. So I'm gonna put a little bit on this end right here. And you're gonna want the rod to slide in from the outside to the inside. You want the end with the hole on the inside because that's where the retaining clip is gonna capture it. You might find that the brake pad's not lined up with the caliper, so you have to just pull on it a little bit, push or pull, and get it lined up, get it going through the spring. When you get it close to the other side, put a little bit of grease on this side too. If you have to, grab the other pad with your needle nose pliers, get the alignment of the spring and the brake pad with the caliper, slide it in place, just like that. If you found that you got a little bit of excess grease, wipe that up. We've got this side ready to go, now we're gonna do the bottom side. I personally like using anti-rattle springs on the top and bottom, so we're gonna harvest this anti-rattle spring from the old brake calipers. This is a different system, it has individual clips on the ends of the caliper rods. You just slide it out, it's a tiny little clip, and then you wanna push the rod out and then get your spring out. And then I'm just gonna slide this back together. And we'll put the clip back in. Now we're gonna put this anti-rattle spring on the bottom. I'm gonna fit the end into the hole, push it in place, and get the other one in place. 
I'm gonna get the rod lubricated with some grease. Slide it in. Put a little more grease on this side. And then get it all the way in. This one needs to be pulled out just a little bit. And there we go. We're now gonna get the retaining clip for the brake caliber rods in place. You're gonna want the holes of the pin pretty much kind of facing you. And if they aren't, you could just grab a needle nose pliers and twist it to where it's gonna be in that position. So it's right there. I'm gonna slide it in, capturing this one, and then I'm gonna slide it into the other one too. And then I'm gonna push the pin out and I'm gonna capture it into this hole on the caliper. Just like that. And so now the brake pads are properly into the caliper with two anti-rattle springs and with the retaining clip that makes it impossible for the rods to slip out. Now I'm gonna torque the two caliper bolts to 91 foot-pounds. I'm gonna use my CDI torque wrench that goes up to 100 foot-pounds with a deep 17 millimeter socket. You could use a short one too, you don't need a deep one. I'm first gonna tighten them up equally and then I'm gonna get them to the spec. That one hit, and that one hit. I'm now gonna get the brake lines connected. I'm gonna start with a metal hard line that attaches to the caliper. Your replacement calipers are most likely gonna have a protective plastic cap or plug that protects the thread, so just pull that out. And then I'm just gonna get this thing started hand tight. Next, I'm gonna get the steel braided line connected to the metal hard line. You've got to go through this bracket right here and get the thread started. Now that the threads are started, I'm going to get the clip that attaches the brake line to this bracket. There's two flat sides to these lines and you have to line that up with the bracket and insert it. And once you have the right orientation, you can slide the clip in and capture the line. Then what you'll want to do is you'll want to grab a screwdriver or a pry bar and knock it in position. All right, so now that is properly capturing the brake line. Next, we're going to attach the braided steel line to the upper metal hard line. I'm going to utilize a small flat blade screwdriver to help me get this vacuum cap off of here. Okay, brake fluid is going to immediately start dripping out and then get your line in place and get the thread started. Okay, that started pretty good. And I have to do the same thing with this side. I have to get the brake line into the bracket properly and then get the clip in place. Okay, that's in place. Have the flange facing up, capture it in there, and then knock it in place with a pry bar and a hammer. You don't even really need a hammer. You could do it with your hand, really. Okay, that's in place. Now to get these brake lines from stopping leaking, I'm going to tighten them up a little bit. I'm first going to utilize my open end wrench just to get them cinched up a little more. All right, those are all cinched up. I pretty much got the leaking stopped. I'm going to finish the tightening with the flare nut wrench. I'll start at the top one. Okay, that one's tight. I'll get this one next. That one's tight, and I'll finish with the one that attaches the hard line to the caliper. There is a torque value for these, but I just always gone by feel. You don't want to go too crazy, but you want them tight enough to where they don't leak. Okay, that's good. They're all tight. You're just going to want to wipe up all the residual brake fluid that dripped out. And we're pretty much done with the install of the upgraded GX 460 brake calipers and rotors onto a GX 470. Now what we have to do is we have to bleed the brakes. We're ready to start the bleeding procedure. You're going to want to make sure that your master cylinder is topped off to the max level. If it isn't, top it off with some DOT 3 brake fluid. Brake fluid is really corrosive to paint so if you don't want to lose 
some of the paint off your vehicle, be really careful. Right now I got some fender covers on this side to where if I do end up spilling any, it's gonna end up on the cover and not on Ton's paint. We're just gonna keep this here for right now, but as we're bleeding it, when the level goes down below the minimum, we're gonna to wanna to top it off a little bit. We're gonna to wanna to keep it between the minimum and maximum through the whole bleeding procedure. When you're bleeding the brakes on a GX470, the proper procedure is you wanna insert the ignition key and turn it to the on position. This has an electric brake booster and you want that to have power when you're bleeding the brakes. The bleeding procedure for this truck is also a little bit different than you would think. Usually you start with the wheel furthest from the master cylinder which would be the passenger rear and then you would do the driver rear passenger front and then finally driver front with this gx470 the factory service manual specifies you start with the passenger front then the driver front then the passenger rear and then the driver rear because we didn't lose too much brake fluid we're just going to bleed the front brakes so we're going to start with the passenger side front. But first, Ton's gonna get in there and turn the ignition key to the on position. All right, we have the ignition in the on position. Now we're gonna start bleeding the brakes. So here's the setup for the bleeding procedure. I have a small hose that's running to a little catch container. I have an offset 10 millimeter ready to go and what Ton's going to do is he's going to pump the brake pedal several times and hold firm. I'm going to open up this brake bleeder, Lefty Lucy, and I'm going to watch some fluid and air come out. I'm going to close the bleeder down and then he's going to start pumping it again. So when I open this up, the brake pedal is going to settle to the floor and he's going to hold it there until I tell him to start pumping again. Because if he raises the brake pedal while I have this open you have a chance of sucking air into the brake caliber which is what you don't want to do so here we go just tell me when you're holding I'm holding okay when I bleed it you let it go to the floor and you hold it there okay yep. until I tell you bunch of air came out okay pump it up again Ton bunch more air came out okay pump it up again Still a lot of air came out. I'm going to check the master cylinder level. Okay, the level dropped quite a bit. We're going to top this off. I just opened up the little aluminum seal on there just a little bit so it'll pour out nice and slowly. Okay, it's topped off and we're going to continue with the bleeding procedure. Okay, pump it up again, Ton. Holding. Okay, a little less air came out. Pump it up again. Holding. Okay, a little air still came out. Pump it up again. Holding. Pump it up again. Holding. Okay, just a tiny bit of air came out. We are almost done with this side. Pump it up again, Ton. Holding. Okay, I don't see any air come out on that one. Do it one more time. Oh, a little bit of air came out. Let's do it a few more times. I'm gonna take a look at the level again. It's still good. Keep going, Ton. Pump it up again. Okay, I saw no air on that one. Let's do it one more time. I think that's good. Now we're gonna bleed the driver's side front. I'm gonna have Ton turn the wheels all the way to the right to where I have better access to the bleeder on the caliper. Okay, that's good. And then, depending on your setup, I have a couple blocks underneath this little catch basin so my hose will reach better. These bleed nipples will have a rubber protective cover on them, so you just gotta pull that off. This little sucker right here. I'm gonna get my offset wrench on there first, and then I'm gonna connect up my hose. Okay, we're ready to go for this side. And we also topped off the master cylinder again to the full mark. We're done bleeding the brakes, 
before you get the wheels on, take a good look at the surface of your rotor. When you put them in place, your hands might have been dirty and you might have got a little bit of grease on the surface of the rotor. Just take some more brake cleaner and clean it off. Turn it. All right, we're ready to put the wheel on. The easiest way that I've found to get these wheels on without hurting your back is get on the ground, get your forearms against the inside of your thighs, scoot in here, take a look at the bolt pattern, line it up with the wheel, and then just lift with your legs and your arms at the same time. There's no strain on your back. Just like that. And then you could use your legs to hold the wheel in place while you get the lug nut started. Okay, they're all started. Now I'm just gonna cinch them up lightly with my gun. This has three settings, one to three. I'm gonna set it on one. And we'll do the final torquing when we get the vehicle on the ground. We have the vehicle lower to the ground and now Ton is gonna torque the lug nuts to 85 foot-pounds. He's going in a star pattern, crisscrossing, getting them up to the spec. Okay, we're gonna do the same with the other side. We've got both wheels torqued. Now we're gonna drive his vehicle into my garage, which is flat, and we're gonna top off the master cylinder on level ground. We're gonna to top off the master cylinder with the DOT3 brake fluid to the max line. Now Ton's gonna to go take it for a test drive, doing some brake checks to see how the pedal feels. All right, the test drive was a success. Ton said the brakes are feeling really good. I guess time will tell if this upgrade was worth it to Ton because he's gonna to have to take it for some long drives hopefully in the mountains to where he's gonna to have to use the brakes and he's gonna be able to see if there really is a big difference between the GX470 brakes compared to the GX460 brakes. Time will tell. One thing you wanna make sure you do is double check all the brake line connections. If you followed our lead and swapped out the rubber line for a steel braided line, just make sure all those brake line connections are tight and leak free. If you see a leak, Give it a little bit more turn with your flare nut wrench and get it to stop leaking. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Ton. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Sick mods and sick GX470 brake upgrades. Peace out. Happy wrenching and bye-bye.